Morning, everyone. Jeff Miller, Coldwell Banker Commercial, one of the co-chairs. Um, to my right, your left, we have Mayor Hoy uh, and Kristen Rutherford from the city, who will be talking about kind of their thoughts and trying to gather some information from this group. Um, and then it is uh, Jim Vu, who is not here, but just text and said he's here in a few minutes. So he'll be here in just a minute or two. There he is, right Walking here. in, right? Walking in. Let's all clap. Here goes uh, he's running. Uh, slow. Yes. yes. <laughs> so as I was saying, Jim Wu is next on our uh, our top our group, and then uh, we have Roy McManus, and then Kirk Sun. So with that. Why don't we get started for the city, uh, Mayor Hoy and Kristen, and I think some slides that she wants to present. Well, I'll just kick it off and then I'll turn it over to Kristen to uh, kind of fill in a lot of the details. But uh, the reason that I initiated this, uh, this recent effort to look at paid parking downtown is basically I've been contacted by uh, property owners, business owners, employees, customers. I have my own personal observations that our downtown parking situation isn't working. Um, if you if you go downtown uh, on any, like I was just on Sunday, for instance, I was downtown. There's no place to park on park in, except in some of our parking garages because the residents who we now have so many more of than we've ever had in the so many people living downtown, it's really changed everything about downtown. It's just not working. Uh, it's not working for our businesses. It's not working for people who work there. And I don't think it's working well for the customers. So we wanted to take a look and see uh, what we, how we could do it differently to make it work for everybody better than it is currently. So that was that was the idea behind initiating this. Um, and so uh, we're, we're in the very uh, beginning stages of this. There's no, I mean, we just initiated the process for staff to start the work on it. And Chris is going to walk through some of the history and some of the, the timeline and what, what that looked like. But we're nowhere near uh, the end point. We're not even we're not even really to the beginning yet. We just said let's start, and we haven't even gotten to that starting point. So that's really where we're at today. So, so yeah, Kristen Rutherford. I'm the director of community and urban development. Until about three days ago, I didn't have a voice and I still can't hear well. So if you can't hear me, let me know because I can hardly hear my know how I'm talking right now. Um, so I do have a few slides. I'm better. So the um I wanted to go over some of the history because this issue, this discussion about downtown paid parking and parking utilization is not new. It's something that we've been talking about in the community since about 2006. I want to give you a high level summary kind of, of the, the history of downtown parking, including past utilization studies, um, community engagement work that's occurred in the past and kind of set the framework of where we are in the parking system. Um, so we'll move on to the next slide, please. All right. All right. So our uh, the downtown is a downtown parking district that was established in 1976. Uh, it's funded by a parking tax on businesses. It was established by the city council in 1978 through an ordinance. And the purpose of that parking tax is to provide funding for public parking, economic promotion within the downtown core, you know, maintenance of our um, parking facilities. Um, and this funding mechanism also supported things like security, uh, beautification, trash disposal, cleaning, all of those sorts of things. And then each business within that parking district is assessed a tax, and that tax is based on the size of the business, uh, the type of business, and whether or not they have their own off-street parking. Go ahead and move to the next one. This is a map of the parking district. So the yellow represents the boundary of the parking district and the blue peas are our parking garages and surface parking lots within the parking district. Next slide. So, so as he's moving that on, um, in 2006, city council was presented with a parking management plan 
um, that was based on utilization studies. And that plan included a recommendation to move to a downtown on-street paid parking system by October 2009. And that recommendation was based on a few years of parking utilization studies and industry standards. Um, industry standards are that you implement a paid on-street parking system when your retail core on-street parking exceeds 85% utilization um, or occupancy during the week hour. And we have well over a decade of utilization studies showing that our peak hour, we are at that level or higher of occupancy. Following, um, following that parking management plan and that recommendation, the council convened a parking task force in 2012. Um, this was to take a deeper dive into the parking system and look at how we would migrate to a paid on-street system um, to look further into the utilization studies, financial stability for parking downtown um, and downtown vibrancy. Um, the parking fund at that point was already struggling to fund maintenance uh, of the three parking garages, and it wasn't the co covering the costs of um, operating our current parking system. So membership of that task force consisted of the current mayor, Count, uh, Mayor Peterson, Councilor Bennett, five downtown business representatives, the DAS State of Oregon parking manager, and Commissioner Brentano. That task force held 11 public meetings, uh, followed by a council work session the spring of 2013. And their outreach efforts included 10 different organizational meetings, um, including neighborhood associations, two chamber meetings, and five open houses. Next slide, please. So uh, coming out of the task force were recommendations to city council. And you see the recommendations here. Those that are asterisked are projects that were implemented. Um, these recommendations were adopted, all of them, by City Council in 20, uh, by September of 2013. They were kind of adopted at different periods of time um, between the spring and that summer. So the only recommendation that was adopted but not implemented was the move to a paid on-street parking. And next slide. <laughs> And the reason that that was not implemented is that there was a citizen petition that was initiated um, to opposing paid on yeah. City Council at that time uh, accepted the issues within that petition uh, in October of 2013. And that petition called for prohibiting the installation of on-street parking meters within the downtown parking district. And it eliminated using meters as a parking management tool. Petition also limited our annual increases to the parking tax to 2% a year or the Portland CPI, whichever is less. Um, and that, as we know, has not kept up with the pace of inflation. So our gap within the parking fund has grown even larger, allowing us to um, cover even fewer of our expenses strictly from the parking fund. And we've had to rely more and more on general fund. Um, the downtown parking system, uh, in addition to the parking tax, gets some revenue from the municipal lot on State Street where we installed pay stations three years ago, about three years ago, um, and permit revenue within the parking garages. But those sources combined still don't generate enough revenue to support ongoing maintenance or operation, security, uh, funding downtown promotions or beautification as we did in the past. So next slide, please. Um, the 2012 Parking Task Force also looked at a number of different efforts that would solve the downtown fund gap. Um, they looked at expanding the downtown parking district boundary, um, deferring capital projects on, on parking structures, which we have done um, to the point that um, we just can't continue to do that anymore. <laughs> Reducing <laughs> downtown operational expenses, which we have done significantly. Uh, reducing allocation of funds for downtown promotion and other services, which we've also done. Privatizing parking services, which we have not done because um, there's, there's not a, a business case for privatizing something that doesn't generate revenue. Um, so that's the challenge with privatizing those services. Modifying the parking structure, uh, which we have not done. Um, extending downtown parking enforcement hours um, to manage 
some of these issues that have come up, like more residents parking downtown, and then implementing paved off-street off parking, um, which would be in the parking garages. And again, if people can park on street for free, then why would they go into a garage and pay to park there? Um, so following that task force in 2016, through the Urban Renewal Department, we convened several focus groups to look at a number of different issues downtown. Parking is one subject that came up in those focus groups. Um, we had over 60 different participants in those groups and parking issues um, and some interest and some opposition to downtown paid parking came up as a part of those discussions. And then I believe it was in 2018 when the downtown advisory board continued to be interest in moving towards paid on street parking and they convened um, some open houses. Um, this was board driven to bring the community in to gauge sentiment on moving to a downtown paid system. So, you know, we have a long history of getting public input and continuing to look at this issue uh, driven by utilization issues and funding issues. And after setting that framework, then I'm going to open it up and pass it off. Oh, the three three hours, sure. So yeah, so coming out of the um, the initiative petition, there um, one of the items that was implemented was completely eliminating um, any any time management of our parking system and having it wide open. You could come down, you could park as long as you wanted to. Um, businesses quickly realized that that was not a good thing because um, spaces were getting filled and nobody could come down and find a space. So at that time, we moved to three hour. Um, that was kind of the compromise between unlimited. Uh, the utilization recommendations are 90 minutes. So the kind of compromise was three hours of enforcement. And that's where we have been since then. So um, there are, you know, some challenges that come out of that. You know, the parking district employees are not supposed to park on street because our businesses pay a tax for their customers to be able to park for free. Um, a lot of these spaces do get filled by employees who then move their car every three hours to different blocks to circumvent that instead of getting permits. We have um, a wide range of different kinds of permits, including daily permits for those that are uh, part-time employees or and hourly wage workers that make it more affordable. Those are $3 a day, but it's it's a system that uh, with that kind of enforcement that um, is really challenging to enforce because unless you are observed going to a place of work, which is going to be probably a first floor business, it's very, very difficult to enforce. And then as the mayor mentioned uh, more recently with the number of residents that we have that have moved into the downtown, many of those are not buying permits to park in the parking garages and they can um, begin parking on street at the end of the business day at five o'clock and stay there until about, I think it'll about 11 o'clock um, the next morning, right? And so it takes up those spaces. And then if they move their car, you know, once or twice throughout the day, then um, they're still covered. And it's very, very difficult to enforce. So again, this is taking away spaces from those that want to come downtown and shop or um, use services. So, um, so one of the thoughts and things that we've heard from businesses over the years is that by having a paid on street system and continuing to have free spaces within the parking garages is that this will be a deterrent for employees and residents for parking on street. And instead of the businesses paying uh, for those spaces, those customers that want the convenience of parking uh, proximate to where they're going, you know, within a block or so, um, would pay and have those spaces available and those that were going to be downtown for longer periods of time or um, didn't need to be as close to a space then could continue to park free in the parking garages. Um, so in terms of next steps, as the mayor mentioned, we are just very much at the beginning. Um, the motion was made about a month ago. So we are now developing um, kind of the scope of work and what next steps would be. Um, I can tell you just very high level that just procuring the equipment to implement this is going to be about 18 months uh, because of supply chain. So um, in no way is this something that would happen overnight. 
Um, there's just a, I'm just in that piece alone. There's a lot of lead time. You. Move it on. Yeah, move All on. right. Um, we will have an opportunity at the end for a question and answer of the entire panel. Uh, but moving down uh, the list, we will run down to uh, the downtown advisory board positions, which is Roy and Kurt. So Roy, please. Great, thank you. Appreciate being here. So uh, downtown advisory board is really excited to be in this position at this point. Um, we've worked really hard over the last four years to push this to the city council and make these recommendations. And it's glad to hear that we're finally being heard seriously. And we have some momentum just in this room. So. And as you can see, um, you know, we have the opportunity every year to review and recommend the downtown parking fund budget. And we can tell and have seen that it's financially unstable and unsustainable. So, you know, uh, we want to make recommendations and we have to the city council and understand that each, you know, each year negative impacts to the downtown due to lack of uh, sufficient revenue of increase. And we are in support of, you know, seeing more downtown events, something that excites us a lot. Um, increased beautification, you know, hanging things like flower baskets, banners, art, uh, downtown cleanliness, you know, you want to see those sidewalks clean, power washed, uh, kept up on. Uh, increased utilization, safety, cleanliness, appearance of downtown parking garages. I'll tell you one thing. So, I mean, my daughter, she doesn't even let me park in the garages anymore. We've had some really interesting and scary moments with, um, you know, lack of security, and you know, defecations in those garages. And I think that a paid parking model would help us support those, uh, those type of uh, things. So a couple other things, um, you know, we would like to place, or we recommend and support placing the, the cost burden on the users of the parking space, not the businesses. Uh, the funding of reserves to cover in current uh, and future operations of capital improvements that are gonna be needed uh, in that area. And then just overall downtown promotions, you know, things like what Jim does and whatnot. So, we're uh, fully in support of all this, uh, excited about that. And um, that's really all I have to say at the moment. Covered it, but uh, I guess I'll add, I think um, making sure that there, as we look to uh, implement a plan or, or strategy for it, um, having good communication and outreach, I think is what DAB is um, supporting so that the public knows when you go and start parking downtown, every, everybody's been used to it for the last 50 years, not having to pay downtown. But uh, if this uh, moves forward, I think making sure there's good outreach along the way. Uh, and then I think probably having a plan for some grace when it does go into effect, um, trying to understand how, how that works and um, it'll be new for people. So um, yeah. Thank you, Jim. We wanted to give you. No, you don't. You're all. You're all going to wish that I lost my voice coming into this. <laughs> so, uh, as I come as the board president for Salem Main Street Association, come from the perspective uh, representing businesses, uh, building owners, as well as uh, residents. Uh, our goal is for a vibrant downtown. The spirit behind, uh, you know, the assuming that. Uh, financial burden for parking downtown is to create a hospitable space. And the whole concept is, uh, you know, Portland may be cool, but Salem is warm. And the concept behind it is that the hospitality aspect is having businesses or customers come in and feel welcome and, you know, take off making that burden as easy as possible. It's like, you know, someone comes to your house, you give them a glass of water or a drink or a case, have hors d'oeuvres, things set out and welcoming them in. Um, what we see over time, the whole concept behind it was that welcoming people in and the spirit behind it was that Lancaster Hall was opening back in the 70s. So you think about it is you're trying to create a similar experience downtown, essentially, so you have a comparable parking experience. Um, that has changed in terms of the demand and the turnover on the street. Uh, the differences between Lancaster and now, whatever, no, limit, whatever it is. Downtown uh, Center. Thank you, Mayor Hoy. I am the Downtown <laughs> Association, not the uh, Willamette Town Center <laughs> board president. <laughs> so we, uh, what you look at is uh, there's residents that live right there in the downtown area and creating that proper turnover. Uh, so I think uh, what we look at from Salem Main Street is uh, there is absolutely a divide in businesses that want paid parking and don't. Overall, the greatest goal that we're looking for in the end point is a proper turnover on the streets. Um, from these parking studies, which I've read the last decade of parking studies, 
um, average time that people parked on the street uh, for use uh, was, I think it was 97 minutes. Uh, that was the concept. At the time, we had a two hour turnover at that time. So kind of framing frame of reference on that. The expectation was that uh, you saw in three hour parking, if that number increased and the number actually didn't, the actual average turnover was, uh, you know, not, again, like 97 minutes. Uh, when we went through that uh, free and unlimited time on the street, there was just no turnover. So it just, it froze up downtown. Um, what we're seeing is the increase of residents um, and employees and people that work downtown. Ideal situation is those individuals park the arcades and customers are parking on the street and you're seeing a turnover. Um, these studies reference that the ideal parking is that you have two spots or more available on any street at any time. That is the right turnover for things to go through. We're not seeing that. So um, that is where the identification that we feel that this current parking system is broken. It creates this adversarial relationship with employees, residents, um, and parking spots, and also the enforceability of it. Um, the rules are very uh, hard to determine. Because say somebody is working um, at a bookstore, and then they're an employee that day, but at the same time, they're also going to lunch and having coffee at other places. So they're also a customer that day. So one person's employee is the next business's customer. But where do you decide that line? It's like, oh, did you clock in, clock out? And all of a sudden we have, uh, you know, Salem Parking is going down and being these, these detectives to figure out were you working or not? Oh, I was clocked out. So technically I was a customer. So therefore I had to park in the street. Do we really want to have our city going down and having that process? It's, it doesn't make sense. Um, the whole idea is, you know, customer, resident, employee, uh, there are people that want to experience downtown. I think the overall picture is if you have a short-term use, you park on the street, you have a long-term use downtown, you park in the parkades. The issue about that is safety. We've had a lot of break-ins. I've personally experienced it and I've close friends have experienced it. Um, so those are the overall picture is being able to create an overall uh, healthy experience downtown and parking is an aspect. Of it. So, you know, the proper installation of bathrooms, cleaning, um, you know, images where um, the overall picture is making the right thing to do, the easiest thing to do. So we beautify the parquets, painting them, you know, beautiful colors. Each floor has a theme. Um, you know, and we have all these local artists and businesses downtown that are willing to engage within this process. So um, I can't say that I can speak on behalf of Salem Main Street's uh, group and as an overall saying that paid parking is the answer. It is an answer. Overall, proper turnover on the streets and long-term parking um, using the parkades is the ideal situation we're looking for. If I could speak just for a moment of the parkades, we have recently, uh, the city manager has recently uh, instituted 24 seven security in all of our parkades. We recognize there's been a problem there. So he has hired private security that rotates through all of the parkades, uh, which, and we've uh, paid special attention to Marion Parkade where we had a particular problem. So that's been cleaned up. We've moved residents out of the stairwells. We've moved folks out of that place. And I, if you haven't been to Marion Parkade recently, you should check it out. It's a much different atmosphere than it was, say, two months ago. So that's just a little bit of an update. We're trying to make that the, the parkades a more viable option for folks because they, you know, there for a while, they really. Thank you. So we have plenty of time for questions. And so I'm going to try and capture everyone as their hands are going up. Um, and Brandon, your hand was up. So we have, we have a few over here and then we'll come back. Brandon, please. Just two quick questions. Um, number one, just talking about the downtown parking fund budget. What I heard that also covers cleanup and just right. So a couple of years ago, you know, we spent like $1.2 million on the server pro cleaning up over by the old TJ Max. Did that come out of that fund? Is that no? Yep. Um currently uh homeless services it, it's a separate fund. We do those uh, the recent cleanups at Marion Parkade, that sort of stuff. No, that those didn't come out of the no, not at all. There's there's no way, there's not nearly enough money to do that. If, uh, there's not enough money to do the basics, let alone the, that extra. So no, we pay, pay a general fund, ARPA dollars, the various places. Yeah, a lot of that was funded through ARPA dollars. Um, ARPA helped to sustain the parking fund uh, during COVID. And then general fund is also pitched in for security. 
but the cleaning services are the downtown clean team that does a, a daily patrol or nearly daily patrol. Yeah, and we are looking, if I could just follow up on that, we are looking at some additional cleaning services. I don't know if you want to speak to that, Keith. I don't want to get out ahead either, but we're looking at some enhanced services. Oh, expanding the SOS team to 24-7, uh, not 24-7, seven, seven days, seven days a, week. a week. So to provide some additional resources for, for our cleanup beyond what the current system is. And the, the second one is, you know, we're hearing all the parking issues with residents moving in, but it sure seems like with the affordable housing units that are planned to come online, it sure seems like we're doing a lot of building, we're bringing in residents with no attempt to address the actual parking issues. Like, what's the plan going forward with additional parking garages on new buildings built? Um, because I think it's just going to get worse. So there is um, currently no requirement for on-site parking for residential use downtown. Um, some uh, developers have um, through their own preference, added some spaces. Uh, I want to clarify that all the units that are coming on downtown are not affordable. Um, most are market rate with some affordable mixed in um, or completely market rate. Um, but those that are receiving incentives are mixing in some affordable units. So 15% of some structures. But a lot of units coming in. There are a lot of units. On yes. all so um, while the decision to remove the parking requirements um, was made by city council. Um, there are new requirements coming through the state that will preclude any unwinding of that to require it. It will have to remain in the developer's options. Um, and the reason that we removed that is because it was a barrier to development. Um, it, the cost of doing structured parking on site for residential housing is somewhere around $65,000 a space um, or higher. Um, and it, it just meant that we weren't going to see any housing development in the downtown core. And we have very underutilized parking garages. So I think, you know, at the point that we start seeing parking garages fully utilized um, at that point would be when we would start looking at whether or not there's need for another parking garage downtown. Mike, real quickly before you go, do you know, do you have an estimated number of units that are coming online within the next, I mean, I've heard all kinds of numbers, so do you have an idea of what that might be? Um, there are a a number of projects that are sort of in the development phase that haven't even come in for application yet, but we're talking hundreds of units. Yeah, I would say, it, especially with looking at the uh, UGM property that we're going to be taking to market, um, there, where Wells Fargo used to be at the corner of Liberty and Chemeketa and the adjacent lot, um, I expect we'll see housing going in there. Uh, and then the former Nordstrom site. So I think all of those combined, you know, you're looking at probably six, seven hundred or more. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay, so kind of springboarding off of that, um, two two questions. First is, what's the uh, current and then estimated demand once these houses, you know, 165 units going to Nordstrom, we got 140 mm -hmm. cars with full pieces. Um, so what's the sort of supply and demand downtown mm -hmm. in utilization of the garages? And the second question is, what are the revenue estimates, or is there a revenue estimate for move to pay parking? And how does that address the, if we make that, if that move is made, how does that address the budget for parking? Um, that's information that, that we are working on right now. We have estimates that are several years old. So as uh, a part of on the, on, so on the revenue to be generated through paid parking. Yes, so those estimates are several years old. As a part of this motion, we are going to be updating and looking at all of those questions to come up with answers to the questions that you've just asked. So we're still at the beginning of that process. But as part of that process, we will be doing new cost estimates for the cost of installing the system, operating a system, revenue from the system, capacity within the parkades, how much of that parking within the parkades we think will be utilized through 
a move from on street into the parkades as well as residential demand for the parkades. Tom, and then we have uh, Ian, Marianne, Jim. Yeah, mine was on the capacity issue. Brandon covered that well. I, uh, to follow up on Mike, then, uh, without that requirement for new development and knowing how we are looking at a housing first model in the city, without that analysis, I guess I, I get concerned that we're putting ourselves in a situation where. We are eventually going to have all of our structures needed for residents because there's no requirement that the, the, the owner of the property has to provide that parking. How do we know if we really do have capacity? Because I, I mean, if you go to any event and at the convention center, uh, I'll use Saturday as a perfect instance. We have our first citizens banquet. Those, there will be no parking in in the first closest, uh, for sure, the first closest uh, parkade, and then they'll trickle over into um, the lot over where Marco Polo and that is. I'm just trying to imagine us in ten years when we have a very vibrant, full of residents downtown. Are we going to put ourselves essentially in a box by not having any requirement that we eventually are just going to flat out not have parking at all downtown because the residents will be utilizing? So I, I get a little, guess, a little more concerned with the downtown advocacy and the main street. Of, are we looking at that long term? So, Tom, one thing I'll, I'll start and others will can chime in, but so not having a, a requirement for parking downtown is is a state law anywhere in town is a state law now. it's not something yeah. that is optional for the city that's the we we don't have on monday night we're going to eliminate it for the rest of, of the rest of the city right now it's just downtown because the state law requires us to so that's just the current state of affairs that the idea is <laughs> that the market will drive that and that and the market will dictate that the developers um, create those spaces in order to build an attract to have an attractive structure and attractive development. That's the idea. But that's the state law and that's going to be in every city, not just Salem. So that's a that's something that people come to around yet, but this is this is the state law now. So we can't require parking. So, but we still have to deal with the effects of that to, to the rest of your question, which is I think that would be and, and then to add to that, um, when demand reaches that point, um, or as it's heading towards that point, I see two options. I see it as a private sector opportunity to develop structured parking that would be paid structured parking to serve residential users or just users in general within our downtown. Or um, what we done in developing the three parkades that we do have downtown within the urban renewal area, and that would be to use urban renewal to build an additional parking structure or joint venture with the private sector to build a new parking structure. If I'm but, not mistaken, if I may follow up, uh, is it correct that the top two floors of the one adjacent to the city hall are exclusively for city parking? No, not at all. So no. all it's, of that is now open? That, um, yeah, over at Pringle Parkade. Um, there are some spaces, but it's a small percentage of the spaces that were leased out to the Salmon Run at the time it was developed that is occupied by city uh, engineering department, but they will be moving in the fall out to their new, new facility. But all of the rest of those spaces are public spaces. Uh, and the one across from the convention center on the top. Liberty. At Liberty. Mm -hmm. Liberty. That's now all open. It's permitted, therefore permits permit holders. So within each of the parkade, there are spaces for permit holders, which would be the residents or employees, and then customer spaces. At Pringle, there's overflow parking for the convention center that's on the roof. 
And there are some spaces within that parkade that the uh, owner, that that building is a condominium structure. So there's a, you know, an owner of the retail spaces that they pay for free um, unmetered spaces within the building for customers. Thank you. So we have Ian, Anne Marie, Jim. Thank you. Uh, I had a question and comment for the reporter. And my question has mostly been answered, but I'm not going to take up time and use the whole number of spaces in the park and garages and do our own conversations on what we're seeing for um, residences coming online. The comment for the good of the order is um, I am somebody who has a, a business and real estate just outside of downtown uh, we got parking meters installed several years ago um, as uh, an attempt by city staff and council to tame some of the the city employee parking that was bleeding into the surrounding neighborhoods just outside of city hall the, the negative impact of that was that um, the businesses that relied on those time unpaid had a shift in cost to their customers that we didn't, all my tenants, including myself, didn't feel was justified because we're not in downtown. And uh, it really changed the dynamic of parking obligations. As the building owner, I now rent 10 parking spaces from my neighbor, Golden's Funeral Home. And uh, most employees have to park in those so that we can allocate because it's an existing building from the 1960s that was built and so to have any volume of customers come to the building they typically use the on street because they there for roughly an hour and a half so now that there is an expense um, added to customers to come to a non downtown business it's a it, it's a conflict with them so i'm on the fence as to whether or not this will work in downtown but to that downtown is different than what technically we're suburban office so to that, there's an 18 month supply chain issue with getting parking meters. You are free to take the one off last <laughs> week. Very generous. All of my tenants, Gladys Blum, the funeral home will all graciously thank you. And I don't know if I can get you probably six businesses that would just go pay for parking in the libraries of parking for some of our employees. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Anne Marie? I wanted to just comment. I've sent several emails again and have appreciated that you guys have um, responded and taken action in the parking structures because, in the short term, to get good usage in the parking structures, they need to be clean and safe. And um, I know you know that, but I want to acknowledge that you guys have been responding. Um, but for those who need to build all the time, people need to feel like they can park there, that their vehicle is safe, that they're not concerned. So that just needs to be a really high priority for you to even start. Those still possible. Uh, as soon as our new city manager became aware of that whole situation, he he dealt with it right away. So, so yeah, we I agree with you 100%. That's we want the parking structures to be viable, and in my mind, viable means safe. You know, accessible, all those things. The place that people would feel are going to feel okay to park. I remember, you know, back in the day when I, when I was in college, we parked in the parking structures all the time, and it was no big deal. It was, you know, convenient, and, it, and it was. I felt safe about it and good about it. Well, I know that's not. Parking, you pay the parking tax, and then you pay for all of our employees to park, and then they ask for park employees to go park somewhere that we don't feel comfortable right. attending them. And you know that's a tough to swallow. So um, not perfect yet, but I think we're at least on the path. Help people more people I really appreciate your thoughtful feedback and your emails and the exchange. I think those are very helpful. Um, and I think it's a really good uh, example of when you engage with this in a thoughtful and, and, and constructive way that good things can happen. So thank you. Thank you. And I just want to follow up and, and just share with everybody what we talked about sure. before the meeting started that as a result of moving to 24 7 security. Um, I've been working with the police department to get regular reports on calls for service 
to be able to look at that data and the impact of the 24 seven security to make sure it's actually being effective and doing what we want it to do. Because um, the nature of these kinds of, of uh, break-ins is they're very opportunistic and they will shift depending on where we are focusing. So uh, getting these, you know, the regular data input from police department and from those that are, you know, showing up in their car and finding that somebody's broken in, letting us know that, then, um, you know, for any of your customers, that can help us to shift the security to focus on different parkades or different types because they, it, it is a very fluid yeah. situation that we got there. When you say 24 hour or 24 seven security, what does that mean exactly? Is that one patrol car going through all the garages or is that? Yeah, multiple? so we have um, we have two officers uh, most of the week, but not all seven days, but we do have at least one officer seven days, 24 hours. So we've got additional coverage at sort of peak times and a little bit less at other times. Um, and they patrol three parkades. Challenge with it being opportunistic, even if you have one or two devoted to every parkade, break-ins will still happen because if they're on the first floor, somebody will be on the roof, right? So it's, um, but we can shift and we can increase focus. And we have also done that with when we have, um, when we see numbers really increasing in a particular parkade, um, uh, for example, in response to your emails, we're having some morning break-ins. And so in addition to security, we've asked police to increase patrols during that time. And we've asked our parking enforcement to do, a, you know, kind of focus in certain areas at certain times, bring more attention and presence. Thank you, Jim. Uh, I didn't understand the, uh, the state law that said that you about the parking. Uh, but does the state law say that you have to give all those apartments free parking? Because no. none of the, like the COS or COS or whatever it is, uh, none of those rooms pay the minimum parking tax like a lot of people in the room. Uh, in that block, the Holman Hotel has, has 126 rooms, has 60 parking spaces. Where are the rest of those people going to go? Where are their Where are their employees going to go? There's 200 spaces on that block that you basically give them away. I urge you to go downtown some morning. Well, Saturday or Sunday is probably a better day to do it uh, at seven. And look at that intersection there of state and commercial. The cars are like for at least one block in every direction. Uh, and as I understand it, those people don't have to be out of those spaces until nine o'clock in the morning. There's a couple of businesses in, the, in that 200 blocks of the commercial that are open by eight o'clock. There's no parking. How can you not run the parking district as a business? I mean, I've just weathered at Magoo's, I've just weathered three or four months. Uh, Contractors parking in every which direction who are working on the hotel. That's great, we're getting a hotel. Um, but why weren't they forced? Why wasn't the general contractor or the individual contractor forced to pay for parking spaces for the common laborers in the parking garage during construction? This is just business. And I don't see the city minding the business of the parking district. Uh, the, the apartment thing, I actually agree with you on something. The parking thing. I agree on more than just that. But. I see what's going on, and I see the only way to get out of it is paid parking. I mean, there's so much free parking downtown that's not supporting the parking district, and, and the only option to get out of it is, is to have paid parking. Um, we're not forcing people into the garages, and there's plenty of them down there. Now, as far as the par apartments go, I don't like the apartment. Everybody says, yes, there's people living downtown. Um, yes, there is. But when they take up all the parking spaces, I would rather have a chance for my business to appeal to the people of the city of Salem 
rather than the little bitty circle of people in downtown Salem. So we're driving away people who are out in the neighborhoods and we're allowing a small, really small number of uh, tenants to take up all the parking. So um, there are just some things that really irritate me about what's going on, obviously. But uh, I'm sorry that we've gotten into this jam. And why are we in such a rush to have so many apartments downtown? I'm not sure why. <coughs> Last thing. Who's going to rent the retail space on the ground floor of the cars uh, when there is no parking? Anybody that comes and looks at it is going to go, oh, yeah, all those spaces around the building are full. So there you go. Right. Thank you, James. TJ? Yeah, I remember uh, former city manager Bob Wells used to always say after a long contentious meeting, if I could just solve parking and trees, my job would be a lot easier and, and it still holds true today. So I know we were focused on uh, downtown parking and paid parking, you know, when I was on council and I think it was a general consensus, Greg can speak to this too, that we were in favor of paid parking. I think the key is going to be the money that gets raised can't go into the general fund. That, that becomes a sinking pit. You never know where it goes. It's gotta be into a fund that Helps to keep downtown clean and safe. And you can't go to the general fund and stuff like that. Just a thought to do. Just to clarify that it's, it, would, it would not go into the general fund, it would be into the downtown fund that would uh, beautify, enhance, and support downtown. So, so along those lines, oh, sure, go ahead. No, good. Next question? No, yeah, please. Okay. Uh, so I don't own a downtown business, but I'm a little curious. Uh, what's the process for the businesses who have outside seating on the parking spots? Uh, personally, I, I don't go to downtown as much as I, I don't like the parking. Uh, but when I do drive by, I, I ask myself, we, you know, we don't have a lot of parking and there's businesses who are having outside seating. And when I talk to other business owners, they don't like it, but I don't know the process. So how does that work? So um, there's a limited number of spaces, percentage of the total capacity that is available for outdoor dining. And those individuals that have the platforms, there is a licensing process that they have to go through and pay for the spaces that they're taking off. At any point, is, uh, do they have the risk of maybe having the city saying, hey, we're, we're going to stop this, and then they have to? Down. Yeah, yeah, it's a revocable license. Thank you. From a parking standpoint, I would tell you your business model, and as long as the city continues to own those garages, you, you've got to privatize parking down, downtown. As long as it's public parking, your business model is broken because you've got so many parking garages that are absolutely chock full right now. Your revenue source, your revenue model there is completely broken because they it should command significantly higher rents than what you guys are paying. I think if you once you privatize the garages downtown and you privatize parking, then you will see third parties come in and start considering building those parking structures at the 65. It's going to be significantly higher than that sooner, right? Um, but I, I just think at the end of the day, there's no way you solve this uh, without with the city still cleaning these parking structures down. Got to privatize it. You've got to be able to bring third parties into this marketplace and get supply and demand. It just is. I had a question. So the last parking study that I read, on-street parking utilization was between 80, uh, 85 to 95 percent, and then uh, parking structure utilization was between 40 and 50 percent. So I just heard you say that the parking uh, parkades are chock full. The ones in the south are. Yeah. Plus, the south side of downtown there. there. So you mean Liberty? Are you referring Liberty Parkade? Liberty and Pringle. Liberty and Pringle. Okay. Pringle's not in the parking district. You're right. Pringle's not right. So Liberty Parkade is is full. Usually more full, much more full than say Schumacher. Yeah, Mary. it's also the smallest parkade in, in of, of all three. Okay. Thank you. I can clarify that. So along the lines of revenue and how that works, um, is there? The current budget has a deficit. Is there an idea of what that deficit is for what um, are? 
the current budget does not have a deficit because we cannot have deficit budgets. So instead, we have cut back on expenses and services, and we have filled gaps through the general fund to up those costs like security. So if the paid parking was, no, I'm sorry, if there's paid parking that um, comes in, a couple two part question. What's the implementation timeline? And then what's the projected revenue that would then bring back those services? Is it is it just fix all problems at that point? So one of the things that we are working on right now is, is looking at the current budget and services we are providing, which have been significantly reduced and what would need be needed in terms of meter revenue to offset that. And then we're also doing another analysis of all the services that we should be providing and used to provide, um, like funding for beautification and promotion, um, maintenance that's needed, um, all of those different things, security, of course, and what that budgetary is uh, need is, right? And then, um, updating the forecast for the meter revenue, and then also analyzing how long it will take to, through installation um, and moving people over to a new system then before we would phase out the parking tax. So all of that's in development right now. We don't have those answers right now. Sure, okay. thank you. Brent, you had your hand up. Uh, uh, thanks, Jeff. Um, Mr. Mayor, I want to applaud the council for bringing the subject difficult contentious subjects um and obviously a lot of things I, I thought what the conversation would be about paid parking and obviously what we're learning is it's going to interest a bunch of others uh for me and it's like idea i've never wanted to eat my lunch in a, in a traffic lane myself so some of the reduction in parking policies i think i'll have to get reevaluated whether or not it is for parallel versus head-in parking whether that's for bike lanes whether or not it is uh, time limited and all these things. You know, loading zone, I've never lived anywhere else where a loading zone was 24 hours a day, which takes away parking availability and things like that. Um, and the privatization, of course, is all gonna come up. So you have a very broad uh, topic now that's gonna encompass, and people are gonna be emotional, but a lot of different types of things that intersect with the parking conversation and not just paid. But uh, I think I'm with TJ and we read way back when it's probably ultimately going to be a painful transition to a more robust future if we generate the income and the district can spend it. Well, I would encourage you to uh, go have lunch downtown in one of our parklets. It's not in the traffic lane. It's in a parking, what was formerly a parking space. It's actually a really nice experience on a nice spring or summer day. I really encourage you to do it. It's, it's good. Um, I, I, one of the things I also think that we ought to talk about for a minute is getting rid of our current policy, which I think is the most anti-business, anti-customer policy, which is that you can only park in this block one time, once a day. And if you come back again, you're getting a ticket. I remember uh, one time shopping for my friend Kaylin here uh, for a bike in the morning. I went there and was looking at bikes and then I wanted to go home and do a little bit of research. I did that. I came back in the evening, not even thinking that, oh, yeah, I parked here at nine o'clock this morning. Now it's five in the afternoon and I got a ticket because I returned to the same block twice in one day, which is the, to me is so anti-business, anti-customer. Like it just discourages me from wanting to go downtown. You can't park. In the, and so this would eliminate that kind of thing. You're, you're the mayor and you can't get out of that. Like that's crazy. it was before I was the mayor. And no, I can't get out of it, even if I were the mayor. Kathy, you had a question. You may not um, be able to do this because I know you're in the process of doing analysis right now, but if uh, if we go to paid parking and that brings in additional revenue, does that either eliminate or reduce the parking tax on businesses? So my motion was uh, that if we go to paid parking, it will eliminate the parking right. tax. Yes, it's not. We're not doing both. Okay. Yeah, that was that was part of the part of my motion and something that I it's not negotiable for me. So, yeah, it's one or the other. I think being a comment just to build off the robust for Salem Main Street, uh, you know, when we first originated six years ago, we were supported funding from uh, the parking tax. Uh, we haven't received funding uh, without special motion um, or any funding from the city uh, over the last three years. 
So you're looking at Christmas um, and the winter holiday parade and everything that we did, that was all privately funded. Uh, those were private donations, people going through um, to beautify. And you know what we want to do is not just uh, you know survive with parking, the whole concept is thriving and being able to decorate, being able to create a welcome mat and really not just make uh, downtown Salem comparable to other places, it's being a step and above and a destination. Um, I've always believed that a, a, a vibrant downtown is a vibrant city. So if we can put our best foot forward where people are visiting with the convention center, with the hotels, everything that's coming in, with the airport, all of those things that are coming in to really, when people uh, come and they look at downtown Salem, it's like, wow, it's a really cool city. That's the hope. I'm going to put another hat on. I'm actually the chair of the Elsinore um, year of their board. And, you know, we're working really hard in bringing unique and different shows into downtown to the Elsinore. When somebody comes from Portland or Eugene to come to Salem to have dinner at 5 o'clock and go to a 7 o'clock show and they walk out and they have a ticket on their car, like, that's not what we're, like, that shouldn't be what we're trying to call. Just, I mean, I know it does happen, but I want that that person would rather pay, you know, seven dollars to park um, in that spot and have a really great experience and come out to their Thank you for mentioning that. I think that's really important. And with if the amphitheater coming online, you know, we're gonna we're gonna have even more events happening downtown where that's gonna be exactly the case. Mm -hmm. Brandon, did you have a question? Did you raise your hand at all? I, I just had one last question. It was just, and all the planning that we're seeing coming directly to the department, are there any proposed parking structures in the works? Not that I'm aware. No, not at this time. There are two areas in downtown that are thinking about it. But uh, in order for that to be viable from a private standpoint, the existing parkades need to be at capacity. So uh, if Liberty Ready is, uh, Chemeketa and Marion have to be filling up for the economic uh, models to work for those private uh, parkades. What would you propose new residents coming in? Uh, yeah. That, Otherwise, that, we're going to go to Kaiser State and the mine test service session. Yeah. So, yeah. So the answer is yes. Okay. The number uh, in the whole concept is until those things come online, the demand is there with somebody willing to put up the seven to eight million dollars to build a six foot structure or six story structure. Tom, you were going to add one comment or? Um, yeah, I know we're at the end of our time. I just, uh, back to the technology side, I know that meters themselves are desirable. Like, I just wonder if there's, there's uh, when you go to Masonry Grill, you just scan. It's all on your phone. It seems like a lot more cost-effective way for us as a city to be collecting parking revenue than putting meters every single block and the like. But that out there. yeah, when you go to a, a, you know, a big city, you just dial it up on your phone, and yeah, no, I'm right there with you, Tom. And those are conversations that we're. We also want to make an integrated system, so. Uh, with chariots because they're going to electronic fair and so you'd be able to use hopefully be able to use the same system uh, whether you're riding chariots or parking so it's like a, a yeah so we want to make it as easy as possible and as cost effective of course before we transition Anne Marie, you're leaving i just want to make sure i heard you correctly that the elsinore is in favor of this sort of thing is that right <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry. I'm going to ask the same. My understanding, I'm kind of, but please. Yeah, no, the, the conversation goes, and we're 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 getting a lot more customers from Portland, and I I'm proud of the block um, that, that we're on, and especially when she's next to work. And um, you know, I had a, a couple of customers say to me, you know, how do I avoid this? And um, meaning, I want an experience. I don't want to just come to the show. We want to go to dinner first. So I have to dodge like Anne Marie dodged the parking meter. And, and it's been a couple of years. But I had this particular conversation. I, I, I knew what she was saying. I, it, she was saying, 
why the heck don't you guys have parking meters down here? And I, I just, it goes along with um, my theory that this town needs to be a 16 hour town instead of a 12 hour town. There's a lot of stuff that happens downtown after hours, but um, uh, I see it a lot more because I'm downtown every day and, and the thing that um, a lot of you deal with is business owners. And I was involved in the process um, in 2013, and it seemed like we had a lot of momentum. And I, I can kind of look around the room and, and sort of guess, you know, where people stand on this issue. Do we want paid parking or not? And um, it's like my bar, Mike, I can never get into the guy. He's always got four people sitting in the chair. He goes, who want parking? I don't want people to pay for parking. I'm like, your haircut's got 16 bucks. People that come in here have hundreds in their pocket. They they don't care. It's not a big issue. But my um, my question to the group is: It seemed like we had momentum in thirteen, and then as as, uh, as you laid out so so nicely, <laughs> momentum and then it stopped, and then this petition happened. And has, has Salem changed? Has the core? Is this room here that's advocating one way or the other? Where do we stand? So I don't know if we can take trouble, but I, I mean, the question is, are we going to do all this work and then have it shot down? Like, yeah, well, I'll just jump in from the chamber's perspective. We're not taking a position at this point. This is more of a information gathering, trying to collect data for the city. So we're not taking a position yet. There's no reason to take a position because there isn't anything to take a position on at this point. But it sounds like there's momentum from your, your perspective. And Jim, I was going to ask the same of Main Street Association is that what I understand is that it's in support of transitioning this way? I can't speak from the association. We have to go to the board uh, to be able to do that and also uh, poll the businesses to make that statement. Um, I want to be able to go off in terms of what Tom had said about the evolution of downtown. Uh, it used, a lot of businesses were focused around the state workers. So you had this eight to five mentality. And then as more businesses were opening up and being later, more residents moving in, it has evolved. So what you're seeing is that the uh, customers of downtown um, are residents, employees that are staying after work, that are working downtown and being the later night. So you're seeing the shift in the mindset of businesses, businesses that are, you know, 15, 20 years and older have that you know, eight to five, nine to five setting. Businesses that are open, that are uh, evolving to later hours are going toward that. So, I mean, Jim, a little bit too about residents. The residents turn a, a eight hour downtown to a 16 hour downtown or a 20, uh, 20 hour, 24 hour downtown. So those residents are customers of the downtown area and have convenience to spend more time there. So I think that's the evolution of things. I think just adding on that real quick too, is, is the resident housing downtown. 2013, there was, 40 total units and maybe in some town. Now there, there's hundreds. Um, so that's a big change to how parking gets used because as much as the state may push that nobody needs parking and that's a magical future, it's not real. And so you get people that have cars that park, that live in coves and have a car and play the shuffleboard game and move around. Um, so that's a, that's a huge change from 2013 kind of model. So um, to that point, we do need to move on. We have our next guest and that's topic. But just real quickly, thank you, Kirk, from Rory and Kirk, from your perspective, Downtown Advisory it is in favor of a, of a change. Is that what I'm hearing? Yep, okay. that's correct. And then Mayor Hoy, you had a comment? I just wanted to transition. Yeah, I just wanted to say, instead of right now, maybe asking, are you in favor of paid parking or not? I feel like, I think... There's consensus that what we're doing currently isn't working. I think I I I don't know if, if there's anybody who thinks that what is happening right now is a great is a great way to be handling parking downtown. The quite I mean we may not agree on what the best solution is, but I think that we can all agree that right now it's not great for businesses, it's not great for property owners, it's not great for employees, and it's not great for customers. I mean I, I feel like. There's a common ground there. How we get to a better place is a, a different question. But 
Um, I hope that we can all agree that you know we need to do better with it uh, because the way it is right now isn't isn't fantastic. Yeah, well put. I shouldn't have asked it that way. So well put. Yeah. And I would just like to share. You know, I've heard a lot of questions today that tie into the work that we're doing as you talk and come up with other questions. If those could be delivered back to sure. us yeah. as we're developing this plan, that would be very helpful. Yeah. And this will be the first of many conversations. This isn't the this isn't a one and done. This is a process that's just starting. So we'll be engaging with all sorts of groups. We'll be back here again, I'm sure, having a similar conversation. So yeah, this is this is a this is just the beginning. Well, if you would all join me saying thank you to to join us now. Hey, I apologize for not managing this meeting well. We're five minutes behind. You can stand, you can sit, you can do your most comfortable. Wow. Please tell my husband that. <laughs> <laughs> Is this on? Is the mic here? Well, thank you. The good news is I'm a lobbyist, so I talk really, really fast. Um, that's the nature of my business. Thank you for having me here today. Wanted to just give a brief update. We just went past the deadline. Um, Lean is well familiar with. We had 2,700 bills that were filed a little over that. Deadline was on Tuesday, so a big chunk of those bills are dead. This report that you have here are bills that we're currently tracking for the chamber. And if you look at status, you'll see a lot of them died. A lot of them we didn't like died. So I'm pretty happy about that. There was a whole section in the Senate bills of the in the 30s that were all related to unfair employment practices, employment law, things like that, which we were very worried about. All those bills are dead. Um, we now move on until May, which is the next deadline into the budget piece after that. And May there'll be the next revenue for, and that is what the legislature will use to actually build the budget. So right now it's a lot of peripheral conversations, but really in May is when they get, they really get busy when they know how much money they have to spend. And that comes in a couple of different ways, how much money they have to put into all the variety of state budgets, the asks, the special asks, the things off to the side, is what they're going to do with tax expenditures. There's a number of proposals around tax credits, tax expenditures, which ones will they extend, which will be new ones that they might enact, what happens out. All of that will start coming into play in the month of May. The Ways and Means Committee, which is the ones who make the decisions about how money gets spent here in the state and all of your tax dollars are used, starting their road show. So for the next six weeks on Fridays, they're going out and around the state. They start in Portland this weekend. They're going to Ontario, Roseburg, Newport. There's one in Salem in May at the Capitol. And the idea of that is to gain input from local areas around the state about what's important to you. What is it that you want them to really consider when they're looking at budgets? So a couple of things I just wanted to highlight that we talked about before that I think would be interesting and in where they lie right now. And um, I'm gonna go through my little cheat sheet here, but you can certainly look it up and I can send this to Lena if you want, if that's helpful to send out to people because once again, ask Ryan, I talk fast. Uh, Senate Bill 851, employer liability for workplace bullying. If this would pass, if this had passed in its current form, Oregon would have been the first state to have a liability on employers, including a private right of action if an employee felt slighted. This bill did pass out, but it was amended to have model policy languages that might be adopted. So there's no mandate coming to employers. The bill was whittled down to, here's what we think might be good and we hope that you might adopt it but nothing if it's a mandate. So we feel very good about that. The expanded right to refuse dangerous work. Senate Bill 907, I can speak for one tire dealer who almost had heart failure over this one. Senate Bill 907 would be an expanded right to refuse work for reasons including heat, cold, equipment, chemicals, animals, anything that would be an OSHA type of issue. It would also allow employees to refuse work to take paid sick time to compensate for those hours. A deal was made with a wide variety of employer groups on this bill when they came to agreement. If you would like to know what that is, I do have this here, which I won't spare you to read unless you'd like me to. Um, so the deal was made with the employer groups and it is going to the floor, but it is in a place where groups like Oregon Business and Industry feel comfortable with. So I'm um, happy to dig into that a little bit if you'd like. Time at, the end of at the time at the end, right on. Mandatory pay disclosures. This is a hot topic for all my buddies who live out in DC, which is where I started my career. This is kind of the new hot thing. Senate Bill 925 would have required employers to disclose pay range and employer benefits within a posting or for a promotion. The tech industry, this is always this has been like kind of a colossal fail. Bill died. Dead. 
expanded age discrimination, age discrimination liabilities, House Bill 2800 would have put into place. And frankly, I, I think there are, it would have it would have been a lot of complexity around age discrimination. As somebody who is not as young as my daughter thinks, she thinks I'm 21 and that's why she will get everything when I die. Um, what this will do, what it would have done, would have changed the age discrimination laws, it would have changed, for example, how you worked in experience versus numbers of years versus things like that. Um, for example, I work within the fire service a lot. So seniority is a very big component of how the fire service operates in law enforcement. It would have caused great complexity in there. The bill is dead. I would say that the proponents of it are trying to find another vehicle, but they don't have the votes within the Democratic caucus. I think that one's gone. Elimination of natural gas and residential housing, House Bill 3152. This bill and Zach's other favorite bill both died. So bye-bye. Um, this one I'm a little concerned about, but we'll see what happens. So it's House Bill 3229. This is a DEQ Title V permit fees. So this would allow DEQ to raise additional fees without legislative approval every three years. So this bill did move out of the Environment Committee. It is on its way to Ways and Means. So for those of you that operate in that space, it's really looking at kind of the large, you know, large industries that they believe are larger pollutants. That one is moving forward, but it's going into ways and means. And what I can tell you about the ways and means process is everything sits there for a while and it's a good time to tinker with things or to try to get things off the table. So we'll see what happens. Um, one that we talked about last time, increasing the estate tax exemption. You know, um, my good friend, John Hawkins, who I don't think is here, but maybe he's online and the CPAs would say, you know, once upon a time, a million dollar estate tax exemption was a thing. It's not as much of a thing anymore. A million dollars, frankly, just doesn't go as far as it did. And particularly when you look at family owned businesses or small businesses, you know, it just it just doesn't, you know, cost of goods, expenses and doing it just isn't the same anymore. But that conversation around estate tax exemption is still alive, still going. Informational meetings still being considered about that. If you have an interest in that, when the hearings come up, I'll certainly let Lena and Tom know, and I would encourage you to engage in that. I think that it's been important to have that voice of people, particularly um, people in the agricultural community have really been weighing in on that, coming from my family are cattle ranchers and we own timber. Um, you know, I can tell you it's, it's a different world today than it was when my grandpa bought the ranch 100 years ago. Um, increasing the cat tax exemption also is still alive, House Bill 2433 and Senate Bill 127. So looking at backing some of the threshold out of there so it would make smaller employers not as liable for it. That conversation is still ongoing. Hiring and retention bonuses. This bill, which was led by the Republicans, House Bill 3205, would allow employers to offer hiring and retention bonuses again outside of the current state's pay equity laws. The argument is clearly it's a very difficult time to hire and retain employees. Bonuses are significant. I love bonuses. Um, you know, hiring is really challenging right now. And there has to be some leeway within there where the current state pay equity laws don't allow that. That bill moved out of committee is going straight to the floor. We feel very, very good about that. House Bill 2659, which also was led by the Republic, offers more flexibility working with local government in relation to the governor's executive order on climate. So you remember under Governor Brown, she passed a fairly broad executive order that put a lot of new mandates and restrictions via the state agencies around climate and the environment goals. This bill would require DLCD, Department of Land Conservations, to work with local jurisdictions to find some more flexibilities within that area so that it can be, it can make more sense at a local level. That bill is moving and on its way to the floor. Senate Bill 31, paid family medical leave. This bill actually is an interesting one. It actually is going to delay the implementation of paid family medical leave because the fund does not have enough dollars in it. So because it's due to the policy of the fund, at such point as the fund does have those dollars, then it would put it into place. But right now it doesn't look like today. They have enough funds to put it on the ground in September, which I believe is the implementation date. Senate Bill 704, I find fascinating this whole concept of universal health plan. There's two arguments on this. And, you know, I would say some of the employers that I've spoke to have said, maybe, you know, I mean, I don't know if it's, if it's like a worthwhile plan. Is it less than what I'm paying in health insurance? On the other side, is the health insurance going to be as good? I don't know. I mean, I think it's a big question. Oregon loves to do things first, even if it's not always a great idea. No other state has done this, which would be called single payer health plan. 
but Oregon's ready to roll. So this bill puts a governing board in place. I would have preferred it to be an advisory board, but it's not, it's a governing board. And we'll continue the process over up into the future about how to consider that. Piece of that would be a change in how employers pay taxes. The theory is that that should balance out with what you're currently paying in health insurance. I don't know. I think that there's a lot of questions. This is one where I think Oregon's getting a little out over its skis, but Dr. Goldberg, who formerly was the head of the Oregon Health Authority, has been a big fan of this since he was at the Health Authority. He is currently the chair of this, of the current advisory council. I'm sure he'll be the chair of this. So if, if you have an opinion on that or would like to, as this, you know, as this will put, put in place after the session, I would encourage you to weigh in on it because I think it, it is particularly either could be great or could be really bad for employers, one or the other, and they, they really need to hear from employers about what that means. Um, a couple of things I just wanted to talk about. <clears throat> so now that I'm working on your behalf, I've been starting to meet with the legislators from the Salem delegation and starting different conversations about things. And one in particular, the conversation I've been having is, you know, I believe, and Tom and I talked about this before, you know, he graciously offered for me to work with the chamber, how do we help Salem business? Because I, I'm a believer that we take a lot of the brunt of having state agencies here. And now that we have a whole bunch of remote workers and a whole bunch of large buildings and they're backing out of commercial leases right and left. We have the state hospital. We have a lot of prisons. We have a lot of those things here. So Salem business takes on a lot of that brunt in a wide variety of ways. And when my conversation been was with a few legislators and I'm kind of working through them is, Great, like that's the way it is. We're the capital, okay. But how do we then work to incentivize not just new business to come to Salem within that environment, but how do we incentivize business to stay here? How do you make it worthwhile to still be here when you're putting all that burden and everything that comes with it of all those pieces of the state within, within our city? What do we do about that? Is, you know, should there be a credit? Should there be an incentive fund? What should there be? to help business, small business in particular, to make it worth it, you know? And again, I apologize. I speak a lot with Cascade Fire. I seem to know them well. And, you know, I mean, it, it's been challenging with, you know, facts and this, but also with, you know, just the, just everything that's been swirling around as a result of being in the capital city. How do you make that better? How do you make it worth it to stay here? The other conversation we've been having is around paid family medical leave. We get it. And this is a conversation I had with um, Representative Anderson the other day, like, I get you. We're, I mean, Senator Patterson, the bill, the bill is passed. It's going to be implemented. And we understand that, you know, an employee will have that right now to take up to 12 weeks of paid family medical leave. But what do you do for a business that has maybe 12 people? And the one person that's out is that one person that knows how to do that one thing that's so critical to your business. You know, and one legislator said, well, what about a temp agency? I said, well, A, they don't know how to do that. You know, they might not be that well-versed technician, mechanic, you know, analyst, whatever that position is. And B, temp agencies don't have them. Temp agencies are struggling with the same hiring issues that everybody is right now. It, it doesn't make sense. How do you help an employer survive that? If you only have 12 employees and you've lost a 12th of your workforce for 12 weeks and you can't replace that position, what do you do? There has to be some way to help employers live that, live through that. Again, what is that? Is that developing a side fund for employers that need it out of the funds from the paid family medical leave program that employers can tap into when they need to? What does that look like? But we need to have that conversation. And it always blows my mind in the capital and it shouldn't after this long. And I started in DC, so it really shouldn't. That people are like, wow, I hadn't thought about that. I'm like, okay, well, here we are. We're gonna think about it now. So we're having that conversation. My other really strong goal is to make sure that the city of Salem, the Salem business is at the table when we're talking about things about Salem. You should not move within that capital when you're talking about something that will impact Salem until you've talked to us first. So for example, Representative Anderson is very passionate about streetcar. I'm not sure we're on the same page, but the bill around a feasibility study will likely go. Therefore, it is absolutely critical that the chamber is at the table. Regardless, we may not agree, we may find a middle road, we may not find any road, but we must always be at the table, we must always be first of mind when it comes to those conversations around that that are happening within the legislature. I think the chamber does a great job of elevating it like this conversation, I got a lot of opinions about parking in downtown Salem, I'm just going to say that, but 
I, you know, but I also, I think within the legislature, it's absolutely critical too, that the Salem delegation is thinking first, what does Salem business say? They may not always vote with us, but they should always think about what we think first when they're having that conversation. That is my ridiculously fast report. <laughs> uh, any questions from anyone? Uh, I have a chance to go through the whole reports we've seen there just to tell them all. Are you following or do you have any update on the staff price? I, I do, but it's sitting on my laptop and I can I can get that to you. Following it, I have been, not been following it for the chamber, I've been following it for one of my other clients, Uber. We care a lot about data privacy and oddly enough, accountants care a lot about it because now that a lot of people file tax forms through their accountants electronically, data privacy has become a big thing. But I can send you an update on that from TechNet, which is the larger technology association that we work. Tom? Uh, Nicole, thanks for being here. The uh, grub uh, bill, is that making it- Alcohol free? delivery? Uh, no, this is the uh, capping of- It died. Delivery, so. Died. You are welcome. Does, do you know what it costs for when Anderson wants to do a study? Mm -mm. Uh, what, what does the study cost? Well, that will depend. So it will get a fiscal. That one would be through the Department of Transportation. And it'll, it'll just depend. Fiscals, you would think, would be a fairly like, here's the formula and you do it. It isn't. It's all political. Like, do they, do they want to give it to him so they're going to make it a low cost? Do they, does the legislature tell them what to make it or not? It's all never quite as clear. You know, if, if I want to kill a bill, I'm going to work with an agency to get that fiscal up as high as I humanly can. So it it is never, people are always surprised by that. If it's not, it's, it's not clear cut. It's not if they want him to have this bill, they'll put the fiscal really up. Yeah. Okay. Uh, clarification real quick on the, on the state plan side, the $9 Yep. That is uh, House Bill 2426. And what are they saying that they're going to, the proposed rate being phase two or change? It's a conversation. So, you know, I don't know, they don't have a target. It's more about is this the right time? The state is fluid, you know, it's got tons of money right now. We can kind of afford to do it. And what is that right dollar? Currently, the it's a million dollars. It's the one. Right. And so I should know if it was a projected three million or whatever. Not yet. I think it's just a conversation about the need for a revision. Are they hearing? Are they hearing the message loud and clear that I work in that field that our clients and um, we advise that it's best for them to die in different states, so therefore they can. You talk about lost revenue. Right. I think that that's an important message to, for them to keep hearing. They continue to have meetings about it. They continue to have opportunities to weigh in on that. So I would encourage you. And as that comes up, we'll make sure that the chamber is aware of that. I think it's important they hear from as many people as possible to understand that, you know, everybody knows that the dollar doesn't go as far as a dollar used to go. Yeah, um, just from my perspective, I really enjoy Nicole coming and giving us these updates. We, we've not had that in the past, and uh, I find it very valuable. I hope everyone else does as well. So from just for me personally, thank you. But from the chamber also, I feel very comfortable saying thank you. From thank the chamber you. being here, uh, Nicole will be here again uh, throughout the legislature. And so um, to that point, uh, our next meeting is May 4th, and it's about city budgeting. If you've not been paying attention to um, the Revenue Task Force, there was one that met last night, there was one a while back. Um, I would encourage you to go look at some of those those videos and watch some of that. Tom, you had something you wanted to add? But uh, I'm just going to put it on the table. You, you need to be here uh, in May because... Uh, the primary driver, uh, there's going to be a little bit of uh, shuffling. You're going to hear, oh, we're going to raise some of the operator fees and the like. The real thing to pay attention to is an employee paid payroll tax. And so that item alone uh, hopefully drives you to come right back to this room in a month. That has been discussed in, the, in those uh, meetings. So... It's definitely on the table. I think that's one of their big things. And, and, and on top of that is you, your utility bills uh, from the city will be going out as well as part of that task force. And uh, anyway, with that, Nicole, thank you very much. Thank you.
that, we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. See you. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure.